wanting something from you, Lord, and that we want to also just be a hearer of your word, but also a doer of your word, and we will receive what Elias says wholeheartedly, and we thank you, Lord, for him. In Jesus' name I believe, amen. Amen. A round of applause for our beautiful youth team. I want to take the opportunity to say thank you, Bishop and the rest of the clergy. This is a beautiful opportunity, and we need more opportunities like this. Um, I don't remember who used to say this. It's been a while since I heard it, but we used to say that the youth are not the leaders of tomorrow, but of today. Leading starts here, it starts now. It's something you learn now, not something you bank on happening in the future. I am going to be delivering a very short message, something that we all know, but something that is quite fundamental to being a Christian and to following Christ. The title of my message is from a very famous passage that I'm pretty sure we all know and we all quote all the time. It is, love your neighbor as you love yourself. Amen. I chose to preach about this because I think it is something that is near and dear to me and something that you cannot be a Christian if you do not understand this. Jesus was about love. Jesus was about serving his community. And that is what I want to take us on today. It's a journey of learning what is love and how to love. That's right. I'm going to start with a very, very basic passage, but it's quite fundamental to all of this. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 5. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 5. I'll give everybody a second to get there. Okay, starting with verse 4. Um, I'll give them a second to get 1 Corinthians 13, 4 to 5. And it says, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. And going to verse 5. It does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. It is not provokes, provoked and thinks no evil. My version says it does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs. I want to emphasize verse 5 especially. Um, we have read and have put to heart what verse 4 says. But we often do not look to verse 5, which is a very critical equation to this whole thing. And the part that I really, really want to emphasize is this right here. It does not seek its own, and it thinks no evil. You cannot love if everything is about you. You cannot love if you cannot put yourself in somebody else's shoes. It is called sympathy. It is called empathy. You have to learn to walk a mile in somebody else's shoes. And if you have read about Jesus, about the apostles, about his disciples, it was very much about learning how other people live, learning what their challenges are, and supporting each other. Because if you cannot support each other, if you cannot connect with each other, then there is no love. I want to jump to a passage in the Old Testament, in the book of Leviticus, 
chapter 19, verse 18. Thank you. All right. And verse 18 says, You shall not take vengeance, nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. I am the Lord. That part is, this last part is very, very important to me because this shows that it is a direct command from God. God saw it as important enough for him to put his name here again to remind you who it is from and to show you how important it is. And again, we see the same theme come up again. You are not to seek revenge. You are not to bear a grudge. Because when you love, you cannot keep a record of wrongs. When you love, you have to learn to forgive. There is no love without forgiveness. If we look at the relationship between God and the Israelites, between God and his people, there is a lot of grace. There's a lot of mercy. There's a lot of forgiveness. And we cannot follow Christ if we do not learn to forgive. If we do not learn how, as Jesus said, to turn the other cheek. What he meant by that is, do not take revenge, because revenge is not of God. When you take revenge, when you take justice into your own hands, there is a certain distrust inherent in it. Because if you trust God, you will let him take the reins. If you trust God and if you love God, you know that he will fight for you and you will not need to take your own revenge. And the next part says, against the children of your people. But who is your people, right? Who are the children of your people? And this part is important to define. Your people talks about community, talks about fellowship. And I have a quick definition that I think important to visit. It's about community. According to the dictionary, community is a group of people united by a common goal or a common struggle. And so your people are the people who struggle with you, who you share a goal with, and who are our people. Our people as Christians are people who share the goal to love God and to follow Christ, who struggle with us to remain in the path of God. Amen. That is who our people is. And if you bear a grudge against your people, if you take vengeance against your own people, then there is no unity. There is no cord tying us together. You have to trust your community to uphold you, to be able to survive, to be able to nurture that community. And... Speaking of nurturing, I want to move to Deuteronomy 15, verse 7. A quick verse, but one that I think is very, very important. And it says, If there is among you a poor man of your brethren within any of the gates in your land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not harden your heart, nor shut your hand from your poor brother. And verse 8. But you shall open your hand wide to him, and willingly lend him sufficient for his need, whatever he needs. It doesn't say, maybe if you can afford to give it to him. Right? It doesn't say... Maybe if you think you can spare it. 
there is a certain sense of radical love, of radical acceptance that comes with loving, that comes with community. And verse 7 and 8 here is talking about that. It's talking about being open, about being generous. You have to learn how to give. You have to learn how to share. Um, there's another very common phrase that we all love to say all the time, and that is, sharing is caring. But why is that important? And why do we say it all the time? Because what God has given us does not belong to us. It belongs to him. And when you hold it so tight, you're cutting yourself off from God and from your community. And that's why we're being encouraged to be open-handed. You cannot receive if you do not give. If your box is full, if you do not give, you will never receive anything new. Because what God has given you is to benefit everybody around you and you as well. But when you refuse to give, when you prioritize yourself, when you're selfish, you're cutting yourself off from the blessings of God and from his mercy. Because God works in wonders. We all know this. Sometimes he will... Do a miracle and bless you directly. But in many, many instances, he uses other people in your life to help you in your time of need. But if you do not give, if you are not generous, if you're not compassionate, you are cutting yourself off from the very community that God has put up to support you in your time of need. Let's go to Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9. It says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. What does verse 10 say? For if they fall, one will lift up his companion. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. When you're by yourself, you're an individual. And no matter how strong, no matter how accomplished, no matter how much you know, everybody has limitations. Everybody has pitfalls. Nobody is perfect. And that is why God has put us in this world together. Because where two or three are, there is a community. And when that community is blessed by God, when the presence of God is in that community, there is supernatural strength there is divine intervention and above all there is space for love there is space for mercy um while i was preparing this i happened to come across a very random video i was talking about how ropes are made um, who's ever been to a shipyard where they put all the boats and tie them down? If you look at it, those ropes are usually very thick, and it's just one rope holding this massive ship. But if you look at the rope, it is not just one string. It is usually two or three ropes braided together to give it strength. Because even if one starts to fray and to chafe away, 
there is still others to give his strength. And that really made me think about how strong community can be. Because where you might be weak, someone else in your community might be strong. And where you're strong, it is used to serve the rest of your community. We are supposed to complement each other's strengths. And this is why we are told to not revenge. We are told to forgive. Because we all have weaknesses. And if we do not stand up for each other as brothers and sisters, who will stand up for us? Jesus Christ made it such a big point to love. The greatest commandment is love your God and then love your neighbor. Because Jesus knew that without love, we cannot make it anywhere in this world. This world is built with so many traps in place, with so many pitfalls in place, and without each other, without the strength of God, we cannot make it. And I'm just going to paraphrase another strong verse, which is Proverbs 17, 17. It says, let me get there really quickly. A friend loves at all times, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. Again, we're talking about love, we're talking about strength, we're talking about unity, because those things go hand in hand. If you are not united with your brothers and sisters, you cannot move forward. If you do not have love, you are empty. Uh, I want to jump to John 13. Uh, it's a direct verse about Jesus and his disciples. John 13, 34. And this is when the Pharisees and Sadducees were trying to trap Jesus. And they asked him, oh, teacher, if you're so wise, then tell us, what is the greatest commandment that's ever been given? And Jesus responded that you're supposed to love God above everything else. That is non-negotiable. That has never changed from the beginning to the end. Right. And it never will. Mm -hmm. But he also added, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And the thing that strikes me about this so much is that Jesus didn't just tell us to love one another. He demonstrated it first. He showed us how to love. He gave us the template of what love should be. Love is not about taking. It is not about demanding. It is not about standing above everybody. Because think about it. Of everybody who has ever walked in this earth, Jesus had the right to take whatever he could. It all belonged to him anyway. But when he came, he came to serve. He washed his disciples' feet. Let's take a second and think about that. That the most powerful, the greatest we have ever seen went on his knees and washed somebody else's feet. Feet that <laughs> wore open shoes, mud, dirt, and all sorts of things, but Jesus chose to wash their feet. He didn't sit down and ask them to wash his feet. He didn't sit down and ask them, go get, go get me this or do this. He showed them. 
he taught them. And if you look at how Jesus taught, if you look at how Jesus preached, it was always through actions. Because actions speak louder than words. Paul also said, faith without action is dead. And so, as Christians, as followers of Christ, as those united together under Christ, we must learn how to serve. We must learn how to show, not tell. Because if we cannot serve, if we cannot serve each other, if we cannot love one another, then we cannot call ourselves followers of Christ. Even when he was sh showing us how to pray, he let us know that we acknowledge God, but we also ask for forgiveness, and we forgive others. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Out of everything that Jesus could have added in that prayer by showing the disciples, he chose to say, God, forgive me the way I have been forgiving others. Has anybody, anybody ever paused to think about why? Jesus chose to say, forgive me the way I've forgiven others. There is power in doing. Your words, your actions hold a lot of power. And if they do not carry love, if they do not carry compassion, you tear yourself from God and you tear yourself from your community. I want to move to another verse. Let's go to uh, Isaiah 58 and verse 6. This one is a little different in that it talks about something very different but still fundamentally Fundamentally important. And verse 6. Is this not the fast that I have chosen? To lose the bonds of wickedness. To undo the heavy burdens. To let the oppressed go free. And that you break every yoke. Verse 7. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry? And that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out, when you see the naked, that you cover him, and that you not hide yourself from your own flesh. This verse talks about fasting, right? But in it, it adds another part to it, in that when you are denying yourself food, and otherworldly comforts, you are to go a step further, and what you were to have, you give. Instead of eating that food, you give it. You fast to share your bread. You use your home to shelter someone who needs it. Because what God has given you, you use to up lift your own community. What God has given you, you use to bring others up. Because everybody has a time where they need something. And if you do not live to serve, if you do not live to bring others up, then you might find that in your own time of need, there is no one there. And the thing that strikes me about this verse especially is that 
It talks about the poor. It talks about the needy. People who fall through the cracks of society. People who we forget about in our day-to-day -day lives. But it says, when you fast, when you are seeking that deeper connection with God, go give food. Go donate. Go do something that brings more to your community. Go put your time and your effort in places where it is needed. Because as Christians, we are supposed to make this our life. Christianity is not just a Sunday thing. You don't come to church and then leave. You're supposed to carry what you are throughout your whole life, throughout your whole days. And that is supposed to be giving, that is supposed to be loving. And I have just one more verse. Mark 10, verse 44. And it says, and whoever of you desires to be first shall be slave of all. What does this mean? You cannot proceed in life expecting to be the greatest, expecting to be the biggest, best leader anybody has ever seen until you learn how to serve. You cannot be the one who God chooses to spread his word, who God chooses to show his excellence if first you have not learned how to serve. Because under God, you must have humility. Under God, you must have love and compassion. And none of that comes from being served. None of it comes from being better than everybody else. None of that comes from being the biggest and the best. It comes from serving. It comes from giving. Whatever God has blessed you with, whatever God has given you, it is not just for your own benefit. God has his plan God has his will. None of us can understand it. But time and time again, he says, learn how to serve. Because even Jesus himself served. He came to this earth to die for our sins. Which, according to uh, John 15, that is the greatest form of love. Sacrificing that which is the pre most precious thing to you to serve another. Jesus came and laid down his life for us that even some two, three thousand years, we still benefit from that ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate act of love. Because where love is, sacrifice is also there. Servitude is also there. And humility is also there. And so as I close uh, my sermon and as I close my teaching, I just want to remind everybody that you cannot stand by yourself. You cannot succeed by yourself. You need your community and you have to learn how to be kind and how to serve others. Let's close our eyes for a quick word of prayer. Thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for the day that you have given us. Thank you for giving us your word today. Thank you for showing us what we must do to grow closer to you and to each other. I pray that even as we head out of here, as we 
go to the second service and eventually to uh, our lives. I pray that you teach us how to serve. I pray that you teach us how to be humble under you and under our community. I pray that you teach us how to give, that you teach us how to love. I pray that you teach us what it means to be a Christian, that you teach us what it means to be humble and to live under you. As we move on from here, may your Holy Spirit guide us and may your Holy Spirit stay with us. In Jesus' name I pray and believe. Amen. Amen. Amen.